How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, New Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sundays, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Well, I'm back. It's uh, Thursday here on this program. I apologize for uh, not being there yesterday. I was deep in training in the mountains of Bothell, and I, uh, I was unable to make the show. In fact, I uh, I had something I had to do yesterday, but you hear about it later. But I had something that I had to do. But it actually involved uh, professional wrestling, and and anyway, we'll get into that on a later date. But we got a lot of news to get into here today, uh, not the least of which is, are you guys aware there was a Dynamite last night? Well, there sure was. AEW Dynamite. There was a Dynamite. There was a unification match for free on television with a finish. There was a injury, which will lead to a four-way women's match for an interim title at the pay-per-view. There was a talent meeting that took place backstage. So we got a lot to talk about with AEW. So if you tune into the show today thinking, oh man, I love this show because Brian loves to talk about NXT 2.0. I hope he talks about it a lot today. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but we probably won't be talking a lot about NXT 2.0. But fear not, tonight, the Brian and Vinny show, we will have 90 minutes to talk about AEW and NXT. So, that'll be very exciting. We also have other news today, including... Oh, we do have some NXT news, the ratings. We'll talk about that. We got Vince McMahon being spotted in public for the first time. Apparently, this is TMZ-worthy. We have got Roman Reigns talking about Triple H. We have got Filthy Tom Lawler announced for a big match. If he makes it on September 11th with Tomohiro Ishii and uh, plenty more. And we will kick it off after the break. Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. God help me. I'm so, gone. I'm gone for a day, and then dynamite happens, and the, the world explodes. So listen, I command everybody in the chat to not speak until I've addressed everything from yesterday. Then you can talk again. Oh no, dude, these people are out to lunch, bro. What's All right, going on let's in get there? started. Okay. So John Moxley beat CM Punk in three minutes last night. They did the match. They did a finish. They started the top of the second hour. To make you think that maybe they're going to go to the time limit draw or whatever. And instead, they did a quick long lockup. And then they had a quick brawl. And then CM Punk went for a high kick. And he re-injured his foot. And he went down holding the foot. And bro, this Moxley, ain't, he ain't going to stop. He jumps on this dude. He hammers him. Actually, I think so thought they might do a ref stop. But he's hammering him with these elbows. And then finally, he uh, grabs him, hits him with the Death Rider. Grabs him, hits him with another Death Rider, drops him on his old noggin. Covers him. One, two, three. John Moxley is... I forget what Jim Ross... I think, he, I think Jim Ross said he whipped his ass. That's basically what happened. <laughs> he just beat his ass. Pinned him. Unified the titles. And then cut a promo about he hates being called the interim champion. He's no longer the interim champion. Now he's the man. And he says, you know what? A lot of people ask, when's my time? When's my time? He says, my time is now. And off he goes. It was awesome. It was awesome. Now, why did Punk lose in three minutes? Is Punk leaving? Was this punishment? Is Punk? What they did last night was the plan. Regardless of whatever happened last week with CM Punk, that was the plan last night. And it is a storyline and it is going to lead to whatever they're going to be doing at All Out. Now, I've seen people, oh, well, how I, I, listen, when they announced that they were going to do an interim title match free on Dynamite two weeks before the pay-per-view, all I heard was, it's not going to work, why, it doesn't make sense, blah, 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 blah. And what did I say? Why don't we wait until we see what happens? Well, I know some people didn't enjoy it. I thought it was awesome. I don't know about the rest of you. So, for those of you freaking out about, well, how, well let's wait and let's see what they're going to do. Here's the thing, everybody. Listen, 
I complain about things all the time, okay? But most of the time, I'm complaining about something that already happened. We don't need to freak out about stuff that hasn't even happened yet. I had, oh, MJF's going to run in next week, and they're going to do MJF. And, dude, I said, wait, and let's see what's going to happen. If it happens and you don't like it, fine. But everybody is freaking out about something that hasn't even happened yet. And I liked this first part of the story here. I liked what they did. It's actually a great story. I actually, the first email I got last night was, this is AEW's finger poke of doom. I'm like, bro, get out of here. What's the story? The story is that CM Punk shattered his foot as champion. He was on the shelf healing. They did a match for an interim championship. John Moxley won. John Moxley has gone on an unstoppable tear throughout this summer. Which, by the way, someone on the board goes, you can't call him unstoppable. Look who he's... Who stopped him? Nobody. So anyway, he won an unstoppable run this summer, smashing blokes left and right. In storyline and in real life, it's the run of his career. And this guy comes back. With a, he had a broken foot in, what was it, June, the end of June? Six, seven weeks ago, he shattered his foot. He came back. Well, he gets in the ring with John Moxley. He hurts his foot because he came back too early. And in the words of Jim Ross, he done got his ass kicked. That's a great story. Now, where do they go from here? Well, you know, it seems obvious where you would go from here. Well, this guy's going to have to tape it up. He's going to have to try to gut it out. And can he beat this guy in his hometown of Chicago at All Out? Well, we're going to find out what they do. But let's see what happens before we freak out about it. I also saw people freaking out about Thunder Rosa. Thunder Rosa, she says that she's got an injury. She can't defend the title. They announced there's going to be a four-way for an interim women's championship. So I heard all sorts of craziness. Oh, yeah, you know, there's they say Thunder Rosa's got heat. They, they're they taking her off to you. Bro, Thunder Rosa showed up, and she said, I'm hurt, and I can't wrestle. It wasn't a plan. It wasn't a punishment. Yes, the story is she was scheduled to lose at the pay-per-view. She was scheduled to lose at the pay-per-view. She showed up, and she said, I'm too hurt to wrestle. Whatever you want to make of that story is whatever you can make of the story, but that's what happened. It wasn't a booking decision. It wasn't a plan. So they had to come up with something. Well, what are we going to do? Well, do we strip her of the title? Well, we just had CM Punk get injured. We didn't strip him of the title. So the decision was made. Well, we can't not strip Punk, but strip Thunder Rosa. So Thunder Rosa remains champion. And now we're going to have an interim championship match. Somebody's going to win. And then when she's not too hurt to wrestle, they will have a unification match. That's that. They also had a meeting backstage. I honestly cannot tell you most of what happened during the meeting because I did not hear a lot of details about the meeting. It was essentially Tony Khan talking about State of the Union. They actually have a, a, a company meeting about once a year. So... You know, Dave and the Observer suggested now was a good time for a meeting, and they happen to have a meeting. I don't know if it was because of the Observer or if it just happened to be their their meeting that they have every year. But, uh, you know, he he suggested that they at least address what happened with Colt Cabana. Because apparently there are people that believe that Colt Cabana is not there because of CM Punk. CM Punk has denied this. This was not addressed at all in this meeting. Tony Khan did address the fact that WWE apparently attempted to contact several AEW wrestlers who were under contract. You can't do that. Now, I would like to state that when I first heard this, I was just, I was, I, I couldn't even believe my, I still can't believe my ears. You can't do that, okay? But I thought, wasn't there just like a legal issue with Ring of Honor and WWE over tampering? Am I imagining things? And so I asked around, and in fact, I'm not imagining things, but there was a rumor that happened. 
But in fact, it didn't happen. So if it had happened, I would be even more appalled that, that they tried this. But apparently there was there was nothing to that. Ring of Honor, you know, if, if WWE wanted something from Ring of Honor, I mean, Ring of Honor would speak to WWE about it. So WWE wouldn't have to go behind anyone's back. Like if WWE wanted the Briscoes, I mean, Ring of Honor would be open to speaking to them and, and coming to an agreement. So there never was a, any sort of legal issue with Ring of Honor and, and WWE, from what I was told. But I do remember those stories. But anyway, he addressed that. And then uh, the Young Bucks and Jericho and Kenny Omega, I believe, all spoke. And what I was told when the meeting was over was, for the most part, for the most part, everybody left the meeting feeling better than when they went in. Now, not everybody, because, you know, there have been a lot of reports about people disgruntled and issues backstage at, at AEW. And I, I do believe that some of this is overblown. It's one of those deals where there are a handful of individuals that have caused problems that affect a much larger number of individuals. So this is not a deal where everybody's unhappy. Everybody, no, there's, there are a few, what I could describe as considered to be problematic individuals that this is an effect because they're on television. They're working programs and it affects a lot of people. So the, some of the problematic, uh, con, some of the, um, uh, allegedly, was up in the allegedly problematic <laughs> individuals, they may not have left the meeting as happy as maybe other people. You understand? Absolutely. <laughs> Loud and clear, boss. Well, I understand. And I'll bet the chat doesn't, but I'm going to keep trying. I don't give up! Back in a moment, Observer Live! Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. So the question was asked... How, how do we not have a pay-per-view main event now? Shows in a week and a half. And here is what I could tell you as an answer to that question. Yes, 99% of the time, you should have the pay-per-view main event well in advance. And you should promote it and promote it and promote it, okay? This is not that. But let's look at the... Facts that we know. All Out in Chicago is sold out. There are no more tickets to be sold. Honestly, raise your hand if you have purchased the pay-per-view already. Nobody? Okay. Everybody's going to decide whether or not they're going to purchase the pay-per-view. As in, like, actually push the button to buy the day of the pay-per-view, Sunday. So although this is not how it's normally done... The fact of the matter is, if they shoot some sort of big angle, Punk does a blockbuster promo on Wednesday, that's more than enough. It's fine. It's not something that you should do all the time, but it is something different. Now, the story is that Moxley came up with this idea. And whoever came up with the idea, whoever came up with the idea, as we've talked about, John Moxley was never going to be champion. It was always going to be CM Punk, okay? So CM Punk was going to win the title, and he was going to defend it throughout the summer, and then he was going to defend it in Chicago at All Out. Against who? I have absolutely no idea. But what happened happened, and John Moxley ended up with the championship, and he had a great summer run, okay? So whoever it was when CM Punk... Yeah, it was it was touch and go whether CM Punk was going to be ready to return. It wasn't known in June for sure that he's going to be back at All Out. They found out whenever, probably early August. And so the decision was made to bring him back, and he was brought back, and there weren't many weeks until the pay-per-view. So if we presume that CM Punk and John Moxley is the pay-per-view main event, which Dave last night said that is the pay-per-view main event, if we presume that, okay, you have two things you can do. You have CM Punk come back. He has a stare down with John Moxley. And then for three weeks, they have stare downs and maybe a brawl. And then you do the match of the pay-per-view. And pres I, I presume Punk is winning because it's Chicago. 
And he wasn't supposed to lose the title in the first place. So I presume he's coming out of Chicago as the champion. But I don't know that. And I, I'll actually argue later, after we give Mike a little time to talk, that I do not think it's a good idea to beat John Moxley. But, so the, your option was either A, he comes back, you announce the match, you have three weeks to promote it, and you just do the match and whatever. Or you come up with a different idea. What can we do that's different? What can we do that's exciting? What do we do that can pop a big number for Dynamite, presumably, have a few hot weeks of television, and you end up with the same match at the pay-per-view, but it's got more of a story than, well, he got hurt, he became the interim champion, now they're going to face off. That's your whole story? Whatever they do next week, I already like what they did better. I already like that they did a match, they told the story that Punk came back too early, he got beat, now we have a champion, and now... Presumably the story is, man, can this guy, can this punk tape it up? Can he make it back? That is a way more exciting pay-per-view than he broke his foot. His first match back, he's just going to win the title back from the guy that defended it all summer. I think this is a better story. But in order to do the story the way they're doing it, you can't just, oh, you know, Moxley absolutely brutalized the guy last night, squashed him in three minutes. But you know what? That's the pay-per-view match. That actually doesn't make sense. Punk needs to show up next week and reveal, you know what? My foot's hurt. But damn it, it's not broken again. And I'm going to tape this thing up. And I'm going to limp into that ring in my hometown. And I'm going to take my tie. He can do a promo better than the one I just did. And he can sell you on that match. And the whole story is better than, ah, I was hurt. I came back. My first match. I beat the guy with a broken foot. You know, who cares about the summer of mocks? It was just, it, it was like Dallas. It just happened, but it didn't really. Punk is back. This is way better than the alternative. Right? I tend to agree with that. Yeah, I do. And it legitimizes the interim champion along the way. And, you know, boss, I was talking all day yesterday by myself on this show. So I love to hear you talk. And before I comment on, I think, the problem with the timing of all of this stuff when it comes to Rosa, when it comes to punk, because of what's been taking place, I mean, that has caused people to have a lot of speculation and conjecture and everything else that's been going on and the timing of that leading into last week and now into this week, you know, some people can look at it as beneficial, but then you do have people now asking way too many questions that I don't blame them for asking because of all this stuff that's floating around, but it's got nothing to do with the booking. But do you want to hit the super facta of AEW stories since you talked about those two? You talked about the backstage meeting. I'm surprised that you haven't seen any of the scuttlebutt or feedback when it comes to Eddie Kingston and Sammy Guevara because that seemed to be a big deal this morning. I don't know if that's now cooled off during the day, but Eddie Kingston apparently pie-facing Sammy Guevara for calling him fat in retaliation for a, I guess, a... A vignette or a interview being scrapped at where Guevara uh, called him a fat piece of s to what everybody thought was going to build up a match between the two. Uh, any thoughts on that? And have you uh, heard any of the feedback on that? Is the chat going nuts over that one? About which one? <laughs> Sammy and Eddie. Well, listen. Here's the, here's the thing with Sammy and Eddie. Okay. Here's the thing with Sammy and Eddie. I don't know what happened. Okay. I don't know what happened. And what's interesting about this story is I have heard different versions that contradict. Okay. Oh, I'm shocked. <laughs> and uh, so I, I don't, I don't want to, I wasn't, th listen, if I'm not there and I hear contradicting stories, I can't tell you what the truth is. I don't know. That's it. I mean, there's, there's a version that it was a, only a verbal dispute. And there's a version that it was not only a verbal dispute. And I don't know what happened. So there was for sure a dispute, and Eddie did get suspended. Sammy did not get suspended, and Eddie said that he felt very bad about it, and he's sorry about it, and uh, and I, you know what I did hear from people, though? It's like, I heard, man, you know, there's been a lot of stuff that has gone down over the last however long. And what everyone what everyone was always saying was, like, Tony's got to lay down the hammer. He's got to lay down the hammer. You can't let the inmates run the asylum. And I did hear from you, like, 
It is kind of sad that the first guy that got the hammer laid down was Eddie Kingston. Because for the most part, everybody loves Eddie Kingston. And, uh, you know, what, listen, everybody, it's wrestling. And it's not just wrestling, it's the world, okay? There are big stars that are going to get away with a lot more than guys who aren't as big a star. And it happens in WWE. It happens in AEW. If you work at Papa John's, it happens there. It happens everywhere, okay? And, uh, and you know, Tony did lay down the law. And so hopefully the fact that he laid down the law might help things a little bit. But at the end of the day, it's there are people to get the law laid down on, and there are others that don't. And don't think people don't notice that. <laughs> uh, well, that's what happens, unfortunately. And again, there's pros and cons that you can try to make chicken salad out of with some of these situations. But, you know, it's funny when it comes to Eddie and Sammy, that's something that, you know, 20 years ago, maybe 20 years ago now, but like, you know, 25, 30 years ago, wouldn't have been a story. It wouldn't have been an issue. It would have been, nobody probably even would have heard of that one. That one probably would have stayed in the locker room. But, you know, when it comes to the other ones, all this, it's a lot of drama and it's a lot of unneeded drama and they do actually have to put a cap on some of this stuff because it does impact how their viewership is, you know, uh, judging their television show and, and how they're, I mean, all of the talk over people losing their minds over punk and Moxley. Cause I thought at first it was like a little bit overblown, like, all right, people really losing their minds. And it was like, people are really going off into like dark conspiracy theories as to what was going on. And it's like, it's just a story to get to Chicago because you probably want to have CM Punk win in Chicago since the last time he was there, he lost to MJF and you want a way to legitimize Moxley's reign because he, you're, you're apparently you're going to be doing this interim champion thing a lot. So you kind of want to do that. And it was an idea that worked. I, to me, it did at least. So to see people go off into conspiracies, you know, it's kind of by your own hand because so much has gotten out there. Although, Tony Khan has repeatedly said that he one of the things that drives him nuts are the leaks. I, I think there's something he needs to probably figure out there, too, with how he speaks sometimes to media and how he does some things if he doesn't want oh, his on. people to do it. As I got to well, say too. one thing, though. I got to say one thing, though. Good. And, uh, you know, this is listen, I, I know people don't like leaks and everything like that, but I've said this a million times. OK, I virtually never ever am told what's going to happen in AEW. I often hear after the fact, you know, it'll be explained to me after the fact, but I, I virtually will never hear what's going to happen. And when I predict what's going to happen, and it's not just me, you and a lot of people, we get it right a lot. And it's not because of a leak. It's because Tony books in a logical manner. And if you yeah. think about it, it's obvious where things are going to go. It's not a leak. The leak is you booked well. You made it competent. Yeah, I have to get leaks in WWE when Vince was there because nothing made sense. The only way I ever knew what was going on was because of a leak. But in AEW, I don't need any leaks. It's pretty plain to see where things are going most of the time. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Well, let's talk about this dynamite show. You sure? You sure you don't want to talk about Wendy Chu and Tiffany Stratton? I liked it. I mean, the lighting was the absolutely, light absolutely, absolutely atrocious. It was Sin completely was gonna idiotic jump out. and stupid. But, <laughs> uh, dude, I know people don't want to hear it, but that show is a lot better now. We're it getting is. real talent on that show. And I here's my prediction. Here's my prediction show prediction. Worlds collide. Sunday afternoon, the afternoon of All Out, you're going to see a video package at the beginning of the show, lights are going to go out, and it's going to explode back into the black and gold, and these stupid colors and branding and everything, it's going to be gone, and the black and gold NXT is going to be back. That's my prediction. With the rock music, sorry, Wale, you get out of here. We're, we're bringing back the metal. <laughs> I mean, think about it, everybody. Think about it. I mean, you're Triple H. You you created this NXT that, like fans said, was way better than the main roster. These awesome takeover events. You posed with everybody, and, pointed a finger, yeah, you, you became Uncle Paul. And then one day, they boot you out 
and they they vomit paint all over this set, <laughs> and they relaunch this cartoonish, goofy gimmick. And you're sitting at home watching this horrible show, probably watching Dynamite, be my guess. Oh. And then, amazing how the world of wrestling turns. Shh. All of a sudden, mm. Vince is out of there, and you are in charge. Oh, uh, bro, you're, Jensen's you're definitely really gonna go. Laid now. You know, oh. out of respect for the old man, I'm gonna keep it all colorful. <laughs> no. Mm -mm. All right. Chris Jericho and Daniel Garcia face-to-face. -face. I thought this segment was great. I thought this was the best promo Daniel Garcia's ever cut. He's talking about growing up as a kid, watching wrestling with his mom. Brian Danielson was a hero. He dreamed of having a match with Brian Danielson like he had last week on the show. And Jericho just, he's upset that, uh, he's up, Garcia's upset at Jericho for shoving him. Jericho just wants him to apologize. Garcia doesn't want to apologize. Danielson comes out. Jericho's on Garcia and so funny Garcia just snaps he can't do this he shoves Jericho again and then he leaves so Danielson's laughing about this and now Jericho's furious and so they agreed to a match at the pay-per-view and the promo that they cut where you know Chris Jericho goes you know they call you the best in the world but I've been around you for 15 years I never saw it and then Danielson goes well, you, all you do is talk about the dungeon but seriously if we ask Stu Hart who the better wrestler is between you and me what's he going to say if you ask Owen Hart your hero, who the best wrestler is. Who do you think he's going to say? And it was this was such a great promo. And then Jake Hager attacks Danielson. So Danielson has to go through Jake Hager to get to Jericho at the pay-per-view. I thought this segment was great, is what I thought. Jay Lethal and Dax Harwood was a uh, an excellent professional wrestling match. Two guys wrestling! And then Jay Lethal rolled him up, pulled the tights, and uh, and pinned him, and uh, old school, very old school for two did. old school guys. <laughs> it was funny because I'm watching this match, and as they get going, like I love Jay Lethal, I just think he's awesome, and so I'm watching this match, and as they start getting to the finish, in my brain, as soon as Jay Lethal grabbed the tights, I'm like, bro, you're the baby face. Why are you pulling the heels tights? I was like, my mind just totally did a flip, and then it was over, and I was like, wait a second, he is the heel. Dax is the baby face. But anyway, then Sanjay comes out, and it is not Sanjay, Sotnam, and Jay Lethal against Wardlow and FTR at the pay-per-view. By the grace of God, it's the Motor City Machine Guns and Jay Lethal versus FTR and Wardlow. Miles better as a match. We add the Thunder Rosa announcement. She can't wrestle. They announced Tony Storm, Britt Baker, Jamie Hayter, Hikaru Shida for the title at the pay-per-view. Colton Gunn beat Billy Gunn. There was a distraction. Colton gave him the low blow, pinned him. And then uh, they're going after Billy afterwards. And who should make the save but the acclaimed? And uh, I'm sorry, Swerve in Our Glory, which leads to Swerve in Our Glory giving a championship match to Billy Gunn's team, the acclaimed. <laughs> okay we'll get to that <laughs> Britt Baker beats Kylan King uh, notably they gave uh, the women the top of the hour segment which I can't remember the last time that happened so she beats Kylan King and then she cuts a promo it's Britt and, Baker of course <laughs> man she buries Thunder she goes Thunder's out with an injury I wrestled my entire title reign with a broken wrist, which is a true story, by the way. Her wrist was broken. They put her in a cast. She worked in that thing for months, and she kept working, so it never healed. So she's in storyline, and maybe in real life. She's furious at this woman for uh So then uh, they do the deal, and uh, there's a brawl, and in run Hikaru Shida, and uh, yeah. So anyway, Big Schmoz set up the pay-per-view match. But it was a very interesting promo. Don't get me wrong. Oof. Then we had uh, John Moxley, CM Punk. We talked all about that. We had Christian accepting the match with uh, Jungle Boy at the pay-per-view. We had a great Ricky Starks promo. Man, this guy's incredible. You know what's funny? I loved Ricky Starks and Hobbs as a team. But, dude, they split, and they are on 
fire. They're the best Hobbs promos he's ever cut. He's great. And Ricky Starks, the best babyface promos. This dude's in tears talking about how his best friend went after his neck. And he wants to face him at All Out. I loved it! We had the Moxie promo. And then the main event. What can I say about Will Ospreay, Mark Davis, and Kyle Fletcher versus Pac Pent and Ray Phoenix? Listen, I'll tell you what I'll say. I'm a big fan of uh, Will Ospreay in New Japan. But man, at some point, he should be here. And the reason for that is twofold. You sound like JR now. Well, here's why. Number one, it is a hard style in New Japan. And granted, you're doing tours, okay? And so you get a lot of time off between tours. But the fact of the matter is, if he worked for AEW, he'd have two matches a month. And as he gets older, it is going to be of benefit to have two great matches a month and not fall apart physically. And also, ultimately, especially if they get a better television deal, he could make way more money. And there's tons of Will Ospreay matches that you could have in AEW. Man, this guy, I don't know how many of the fans are well aware of Will Ospreay, but man, this guy did like three spots and he was everyone's favorite wrestler. He did, he was awesome in this match. And the whole match itself, it was like just the most incredible six men. Like you're watching and you're thinking, why isn't this the finals? And then, you know, next week it's uh, United Empire versus uh, Kenny Omega and the Bucks. And again, you're like, why isn't this the finals? So they must have a plan for the finals, dude. Because, man, this match was awesome. And uh, United Empire won. They move on in the tournament to face the Bucks and Kenny Omega. And uh, overall, I thought this was a great professional wrestling television show. I think they should have got Wardlow out there just to throw some men around and kill them before Friday. Because the pop he would have got would have been something else. Maybe they didn't want to overshadow the fact that they've announced the machine guns. Which is certainly an upgrade, and I am really looking forward to that match. I mean, you could pick nits, and obviously FTR, I haven't been over the moon about their run there, but in the fact that they have all these belts, and I would love to see them go to Japan, and that's a question probably for Dave at some point. Will they be a part of the New Japan Real World Tag League? I would assume that they would be having those belts. I'm wondering when they're actually going to defend them, but hey, what we're getting, we're getting, and I'm completely fine with that. They've got to figure out a way to build another star besides Britt Baker and Jade Cargill. They have got to try to figure this out. I don't know how badly Thunder Rosa has been hurt, uh, but it's been, we have speculated on that since the beginning of the year, that maybe something has gone, something's wrong. And unfortunately... I said she was hurt months ago and she denied it. Well, yeah, I know. And she's been denying it for a long time, but the eye test has said... Something's was amiss there, you know, and <laughs> we find out that it has been. So, okay, Britt Baker burying her every chance they get. This is the problem with Britt Baker because she's so great at what she does. She doesn't have the greatest matches in the world, but she's such a great personality. But they have put her on such a level over the other women where even if she's a heel, she kills every baby face. She sucks all of the air out of the room, and that's not her fault. But they've got to figure out a way to balance some things out there because they have one money match in that division right now. And it ain't Jade against Britt. Actually, bro, that's a money match. Hold on. That's a money match. It's it's going to be, but it's not to me. It's not to that level yet. The one that if you snapped your fingers that you have right now, it's Jamie Hayter and Britt Baker. And maybe we have something that comes out of this, but Ruby... Where is Ruby Soho? Tony Storm? Tony Storm hasn't had the impact. There are people like Athena's going to change that. I like Athena. I thought she was a great addition, but she wasn't going to change anything. I thought Tony Storm could kind of come in and make a big impact right off the bat, and she hasn't. Everything they seem to be doing, something has got to be remixed and changed there because it can't just be Jade and Britt who are not that great in the ring, even though they're at different levels right now and no opponents to work with. We have had a lot of experienced people go in there with Jade. The matches haven't been very good. We've had a lot of people in there with Britt and the matches are okay. 
But that's all we got. We have no feuds. We have no feeling. We have no other stars besides those two. And I don't know what the the answer is, but they've got to try to figure something out. Because if they're going to do an all-women show... I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm too cynical about all this, but I just I'm shaking my head at it that that could even be an option right now to have an all women show unless you're going to take all of the women off of Dynamite and Rampage, which, you know, I don't think that's the greatest idea in the world either. This person says, I know some people don't like punk losing so quickly, but it reminds me of my favorite moment from WWE of the last decade when Goldberg killed Brock in a minute. If you want people to think anything can happen, well, some crazy stuff has has to happen once in a while. As long as it makes sense in retrospect. I mean, honestly, if 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 it were me, I would have done... I mean, there's a lot of things. I'm not sure I would have done this exact same match in Chicago because it's Chicago. If the pay-per-view wasn't in Chicago, I would have probably wanted to do... In fact, absolutely 100%. I would have done this match at All Out. Punk would have to fight up that hill... Until the November pay-per-view, you do the rematch there, Punk gets his title. That's what I would have done. They didn't do that. And my my presumption, and this is always my presumption, is that the way that Tony books, he's got something that he has planned out for the rest of the year and into next year, starting at All Out. Which they have, you know, how long can you, whatever he's got, I presume he didn't want to delay it. That's what I'm pointing out. So I think that's why they did it the way they're doing it here. And the other thing, too, is it is Chicago. And so this does make sense where the injured guy has to fight through the pain, has to fight through the injury. Can he find a way to win in his hometown? I think it's going to work out great, but we'll see. How long can MJF sit on the shelf for, you know, realistically? I don't know. We got a... Again, we'll see what the end of the year He's is. He's already on the shelf way longer than I expected. Yeah, in a lot of ways, yeah. Uh, you're right. I, I, I kind of have that same feeling. But, hey, they've done a good job keeping everything quiet, at least on that end for right now. So hopefully when it comes back, it has the all the impact that they probably think it will. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. Okay, so this person says, I have two questions. Would Punk and Moxley made more of an impact if they went off the air with the finish? And with the trios match going on last, doesn't that tell your audience the heavyweight title means nothing? No and no. And they both tie together. So the reason they put the match in the middle of the show was because they wanted you to think it was going long. And thus, you were surprised when it did not go long. But in order to put on last, you would have to have them go to the ring at the 55-minute mark, which... No one's going to buy that the match is going to go any length of time if they go to the ring with fifty with five minutes left on the show because the match is two minutes long. So, no, you couldn't have put it at the end of the show unless you were going to do a long, you know, whatever afterwards because they went short, which is what they did by putting it at the top of the hour. They wanted to give, you, they wanted to give the match plenty of time to go as long as it, and that was the storyline. And listen, you don't have to have the world title go on last. The world title is the most important singles title. And historically, it's been the most important belt. But the World Trios title, the World Tag Team titles, you can headline a show with the tag team titles. You can headline a show with the six-man titles. You can headline a show with the women's title. They're all important. That's the idea. So, no, I would not have changed anything about the way they did it last night. I have nothing to add to that, boss. Thank you. you the match and voice. finish were fantastic, this person said. Best possible outcome. There's no Mox Punk rematch that could get me to buy the pay-per-view now. So he loved it, and it was the best outcome, but he doesn't want to buy the rematch. I think there's a lot of people lying like they were the last time around leading into this thing. Not everybody is all about Clash in the Castle. I'm sure AEW still got a core of fans that no matter what, we'll be buying that pay-per-view. We'll be back. Uh, Mike will be back tomorrow. I'll see you blokes on Monday. We'll talk to you again after a while.